Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to start by giving you a little bit of background on how this came to be. So since I first heard about the Stockton University preparing it for its 50th anniversary, I knew that I wanted to do something to honor the first black faculty who came to teach at this institution. Um, although we're missing a few, unfortunately, um, Dr. Pat Reed Mary and Malaku Laku cannot be here today. They're not feeling well. And Dr. Beverly Vaughn will be here. Um, she will be here, <laughs> making an entrance, but she will be here. But we have um, Sean Donaldson, we have Beverly Adele, Ad Adele Beverly, sorry, I'm, I messed that up, um, Franklin Smith, Linda Nelson, and Will James. So they are here with us. Um, Every single person here means more to me than they can imagine because when I arrived at Stockton 15 years ago, fresh out of my PhD program with two toddlers in tow and a husband was, who was still commuting back and forth to DC because he hadn't found work in South Jersey yet. With all of that, every single one of them embraced me, some literally like Bev Vaughn who, <laughs> just ran up to me and hugged me and a woman I had never seen before. Um, and um, I tell people the story about how when I first met Franklin Smith and he happened to know my dad and all the shenanigans that my dad was involved in in Massachusetts that I was kind of professionally trying to distance myself from, but he knew all about it. Um, so, but I can honestly say that if it were not for them, I probably would have not have stayed at this institution. It was out here in the middle of nowhere in Pinelands, which I had never even heard of Pinelands before. I didn't even know what that was. Um, you see, teaching at a Teaching while black at a predominantly white institution is a special kind of experience. It's special in that it can be incredibly isolating and exhausting, having to constantly fight to make your voices heard and your presence felt. But I also know that because of them, I didn't have to yell quite as loud. Uh, most of the doors had already been busted open for me because of them, and most of the foundation had already been laid. So all semester long, I've had my students researching these wonderful people and their many accomplishments and battles fought here at Stockton. And so today, I just wanted to bring them all together and show my great love and appreciation, um, while also giving them a platform to reflect on their experiences. So I want this to be more like a conversation than a traditional panel, even though it's set up like a panel. I, I actually wanted couches for them to just sit on and relax. But because of the sound and it's being recorded and we needed the microphones, um, we also needed the tables for the microphones. But really, I want them to just be able to reflect and release um, and just take, take the conversation in whatever direction they want to. So, um, and of course, by the end, have some questions from the audience. So I'm just basically gonna start with one question and then you know they will discuss and interact and talk about whatever things they wanna talk about. Um, so first and foremost, I'd just like for each of you to tell us about your first few weeks at Stockton, um, when you started, where you came from, and what it was like. And so, you know, you can go in whatever order you'd like, but start from there, and then, like I said, take it in whatever direction you guys want to take it. Who Should we start with the person who was he came here first? Yes. yes. I think yes. that is. <laughs> that would be my suggestion. <laughs> So we can do it chronologically. <laughs> that, was, that was back in 1973. Yeah. Wow. And when I um, got to Jimmy Lee's Road, <laughs> I uh, took a, I pulled over to the side. It was nothing but a, looked almost like a dirt road. <laughs> and I pulled over to the side, and I wanted to take a, a mental picture of that road. Because you know sometimes like when you are flying and you look down and you, everything looks like an ant colony. <laughs> I wanted to be able to bring back to mind that picture so that when I got absorbed in, inside, inside the honeycomb, 
or the bitter cone, I could still pull out and be myself before I got absorbed. And I, I really needed that picture a lot. The word that would probably describe uh, the first few weeks, first experiences, was an initial welcome and then the winds of hostility. Hmm. Where are you going to live? Uh, you can go to Pleasantville or you can go to Atlantic City. Do you normally take young professors to Pleasantville and Atlantic City? No. Why are you taking me, man? <laughs> so I wound up in Brigantine, living with, uh, on an apartment on, I guess it's the south side, south end. And Chandler Nurse was my, was my uh, downstairs neighbor. He used to own the Timbuktu in Atlantic City, mm. and, he gave, and that gave me a, interacting with him gave me a lot of uh, background into Atlantic City. Ah, boy. I told myself I wasn't going to do much today, but be old. <laughs> I'm just looking. <laughs> we know better. I'm just uh, anyway. I know the first week here, I got on some committee, probably the uh, review committee, personnel committee now, and Demetrius Constantelos was on that committee. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I got a release time uh, for the next semester. And he looked at me and said, man, you can't do that. You are right here. You, you knew here, how are you going to get released for the second semester in? I said, is there a rule against it? No, but uh, you know, uh, you know how he was, right? <laughs> Man, so the next semester I was off. <laughs> but when I came back, the belt was out for me. <laughs> and um, let me stop there so everybody else can get a shot. What the hell was it? Well, was here before I was. When I came here, there were three other black faculty who were here, Lee Hoxter, Pat Reed Merritt, and Franklin Smith. And we used to joke because uh, there was only four of us here. And every time some success happened, like a person got tenure, and then two people got tenure, we would say, half the black faculty are tenured. <laughs> And once they got the window offices, we say half the black faculty had window offices, <laughs> not knowing it was only two. <laughs> I, my experience in the interview, this was an interview <laughs> for the job, <laughs> faculty said to me, well, your chances of tenure are slim and none, mm -hmm. and slim is at the door. This is during the interview. And what do they know about me <laughs> that I don't even have a shot at the interview? And as with Franklin, when I decided to move down here uh, after commuting for 21 years from Philadelphia, I had the same experience as Franklin. He wanted to show me nice homes in Atlantic City. This was 21, 22 years later, and nice homes in Pleasantville. And my question was to those who are offering the help, where do you live? Linwood. Where do you live? Absecan. Where do you live? Margate. There was one faculty member, and I had to give him credit for it, Leo Lieberman, right. General Studies. I said, Leo, I'm looking. He said, well, there's a house right across the street from me. I'll get the address. I said, Leo, where do you live? Margate. Margate? Margate. You know the number of black families in Margate? <laughs> 20 years ago? So I had fun with that. No, I'm gonna stop. I had fun with that. I told faculty that I was looking. And they would ask me where I was looking. And I would tell them, Margate. And that would be repeated 
10 times. Margate, 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 Margate. Yes, Margate. Um, I had the advantage of having at least a few who came before me. Franklin and Pat had even fewer in terms of carving a path, particularly Pat Reed Merritt, who was the first female to receive the hostility <laughs> that Franklin just described. And I'll be open for questions. I'm older. <laughs> we came together, but I'm, I'm, I'm pulling the older card. <laughs> um, Short and I came in the year that I call the invasion because there were four faculty, you've heard their names already, there were four black faculty who were here. It was five. Um, there were five, yeah. but five of us came. Now one was, um, he was temporary, <laughs> he, was, he was replacing Lee Hoxter when um, Lee was on sabbatical. But we came and, um, what year, say? it was 1980. Yeah. And um, I think we got a lot of pushback because I heard more than once, well, you're only here because of affirmative action. Uh, we did come. There was a push about affirmative action. But we were highly qualified candidates who came here. And um, I never got the line about, you're not going to get tenure. Because from the beginning, I always knew that I don't care what happens, even though another person came with me. She was a little hostile towards me because she thought I would get tenured because of affirmative action and she would not. But I got, I got tenured because I was good. Whoa. <laughs> um, but she did too. We both got tenured at the same time. Uh, I never wanted to move down here. So there was, I never asked anybody about housing. I'm from Philadelphia. I'm still, well, right now I'm outside of Philadelphia. My family's from Philadelphia. And I don't think I asked anybody at any time about moving down here because I'm a metro child and I wanted to go back. So that was never an issue for me. But I saw, um, I, I, I was, I'm, I'm a community health nurse. So I visited a lot of homes. I took my students into different patients' homes around here. And I did not like what I saw. And even though some of my students, well, most of my students were welcome, I wasn't always welcome in the homes. And people would look askance at me driving around in these backwoods and um, played little roads and places that I had never been, uh, and would look at me like, uh, what are you doing down here? And um, in Philadelphia, uh, I hope none of you get insulted about this, but we call this part of Jersey deep uh, uh, up, south. up south because it's just like being in a southern state. And there's parts of Pennsylvania like that, like that too, but this is what, um, and, and, I would, and these people, I, I guess um, patients always question me, I'm a nurse, question, patients question me a lot more than um, some of the faculty. Uh, I think my experiences are a little different because I was always out in Atlantic County. I was always in Atlantic City. Um, but uh, of that invasion, only two of us got tenure. There was five of us and only two of us got yeah, tenure. Yeah, she called it the invasion because everyone was touting the fact that we had doubled the black faculty. So we went from five to 10. Yeah. Um, and we did that because we had a champion on the board of trustee named Henry Bass, who said, I'm not signing any contracts until you show me some diversity in the faculty. And back then, diversity was defined as African American. Now it's defined as anybody but black. Um, Whoa. When I came to Stockton, Whoa. I had received my master's and my bachelor's in four years from the University of Pennsylvania. I came to this institution as the youngest teaching faculty member in the history of the institution, and that stands today. However, when I came for my interview, the first thing that was said to me with a, with a chuckle was, I see that you have your bachelor's and your masters with the same year. Is this a typo? Mm. Mm -hmm. 
And inside I said, because I'm from Camden and I do have flashbacks, so I could not speak <laughs> the way that I wanted to. I said, if I was a white boy, you wouldn't have asked me that. And so it was a big joke around campus. This kid is now here. Um, I had taken African American studies classes at the University of Penn. I was classically and professionally trained, but at the same time, I got challenges from faculty members. Things were said like, is she really as smart as her resume seems? I had to fight because I was young and because I was a black woman. And that fight went through tenure when irrespective of my international involvement in my discipline, having a master's, a bachelor's, and a PhD in my discipline, I told everyone I'm the purest sociologist you will ever meet. And yet, I got challenged. And I was basically told that, you know, I was uh, not fitting into my department. And my service to the black community was questioned as quote unquote college service. <laughs> and as I said, I have presented papers in, the, um, in South Africa because my dissertation was on South Africa on mental and physical health of mothers and children. And no matter what I did, I could not get the kind of recognition that I deserved at that time because I was considered the angry black woman, the radical, <laughs> because initially when I came to campus, people told me, oh, I don't see you as a black person. I just see you as a faculty member. And I would hiccup and say, and you're a damn liar. So I got the reputation. And I know when um, Franklin was um, my mentor, and I owe a lot to him because he kept me in check when people started getting really, really ignorant and crazy. He used to tell me, Strong, just go home. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that's the kind of fight that I had to endure. And that was, he gave me his experience. And he told me, this is the way you do it. And I listened to him, and thank God I listened to him and didn't have my flashbacks. Mm -hmm. But that basically is, is my story. And I um, also say that Adele and I have become lifelong friends because we came in the same cohort. You know, our children know each other. I have dinner with her every year at, um, at Christmas. And she takes whole plates. Because <laughs> <laughs> she cooks very well. Um, but. Those are the kinds of experience, um, they're numerous, but I'll just stop here and, and let um, Beverly. Well, I'm go. glad, I'm glad I made it. Guys, I'm so sorry for being late. I was at a rehearsal at Beachwood Elementary School about maybe 45 minutes, our rehearsal ended at 10. We're having a 45 voice children's choir sing with us when we give the Rudder Mass of the Dead on April, a Mass for the Children, pardon me, on April 28th in the PAC. Now, why did I bring that up? It's because we're having a 45 voice children's choir sing with our community choir, but one of those children's choir comes from Philadelphia from our black Seventh-day Adventist church, Ebenezer. And I'm so happy because that kind of represents my experience at Stockton. Let me tell you, as I look down this row, you know, I am blessed because I came right after everybody that was on this row. And they were to me, not, it wasn't a matter of age. It was a matter of support. I came from Ohio State University in Columbus, Ohio, and guys, all these hospitals and buildings and malls that are here now were not here. Amen. When I came here, I thought I was in Alabama <laughs> when I first came, right? Yeah. I came from Ohio State, the Ohio State, Columbus, and I went to, you know, and I, so, and I went, where am I? But I was happy to get a job. And when I got here, the people that greeted me, the people that encouraged me, are these people along here. Will James, you encouraged me to go on up, for, to, to go on up for, you know, for, for things. Linda, step by step, you encouraged me. 
We can't even talk about Franklin. Franklin <laughs> told us all what to do. <laughs> As I get to Adele Beverly, how many times she saw me in the hall. Adele, I, I'm so glad to publicly say thank you for what you mean to me. And this was, we had our offices together. Back in the days before it was remodeled now up in the presidential suite, Vera King Ferris was our president. We should give her a hand. 20 years being an African-American woman president at Stockton University. But so John and I had offices together. And Sean would encourage me, girl, we would share stuff. But thank you. And then as I look out in the audience, as I look out in the audience, I, my first year here, I decided I wanted to give a birthday barbecue. And guess who came to my birthday barbecue that first day? And were just the people in that I was staying with? Betty Elmore, she's on that row right there. You encouraged me. Then as I look on, Harvey, I'm looking over at Harvey Maurice. Harry, I'm sorry, Harry Maurice, Harvey's the president, <laughs> Harry's my friend. Uh, but as I look over at you, and we begin to look in the audience, and these are the people that I can see that encourage my steps at Stockton. So it's as though that it was prepared for me so I could stand, so that I could stay. You know, it's like, um, uh, I told a story in my class the other day, and I'm almost finished. <laughs> How my class encouraged me. We're talking about the university course. I was feeling sick. You can hear it in my voice, overcoming bronchitis. Our AK had a big convention here, and I was running to death, and I got bronchitis. So Monday, I wasn't feeling well, and this applies to my friends and why I was able and am able to make it at Stockton. But the story comes from the Old Testament. And the story is about Moses, and there was a battle going on. And it says that Moses was on top of the hill, and as long as he kept his hands up, they were winning the battle. But as soon as his hands went down, they started to lose. And my story is this, and this goes to you too, Donnie, and to my students that I see in the audience, and to my friends, to Raymond, I've known all his life from our church, as I look on the people that I know. Two of his friends stood beside him, and they stood beside him. Am I in theater or what? They stood beside him. <laughs> and when his hands were down, one friend took this hand and one friend took the other hand. And as long as they held his hands up, he could stand. And as I look out on the audience, the reason that I'm still at Stockton today, the reason that I can still smile, the reason that I can still get excited about choir and my students is because People were placed in place from Vera, from all our presidents, to Harvey today, to all my friends that are out here that held my hands up. And finally, not only my colleagues, but my students as well. Like Moses, I want to thank you that I can be at Stockton today as an African-American woman faculty member because I had people to hold up my hands. Preach, Beth. <laughs> Well, well, as they say, well, 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 well. <laughs> I um, came down to South Jersey. I had taught four years at Brooklyn College. I'm from New York, and I like to say York so everybody can hear it. Um, and I <clears throat> was recruited down to Atlantic County College after teaching at Brooklyn College and going down with a two a thousand person retrenchment over the entire city university i was i call myself a baby faculty member which i was so i came to acc um did a good job and somebody noticed me i guess and recruited me to come to stockton um i came i was interviewed by bill daly i was highly praised and offered the job, unless somebody came in walking on water, I was told. However, my new, I had a 10-year-old, but I had a new baby who was four <laughs> months old. God, and I went home and I said, I moved from New York. And by the way, I was so shocked by South Jersey. <laughs> I usually don't have acne. God bless us all if we do or don't but my face just broke out all over, <laughs> for, I swear, for nine months. And they looked at me and they went, what the heck happened to you? 
So I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> um, but I was recruited to Stockton and I interviewed by Bill Daly, offered the job, accepted the job, then went home and was filled with trepidation on getting yet another change in my life. Called back and said, I'm sorry, I don't think I can take this job. Um, shortly thereafter, Ingi Lafleur became the dean of Jens, and I was fortunate enough to be called again. I mean, most people don't, when they say I'm not coming, they don't get called back, but I was called back. And it's important to note that my degrees from Long Island University, New York University, were in literature and language. And so I was in the writing program. And I must say, as I look to my left at my dear, dear buddy, Pam Cross, oh, that I really felt embraced in the writing program. But I had to walk out of J-Wing sometimes, <laughs> okay? I couldn't just stay there. And without going through all the sordid details, and trust me, they were sordid, I remember being really, really overtly harassed by people in my division. And this man came into my office and said, you got some big bears? <laughs> we got some big guns. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, I can't tell you how much these people mean to me. And we have not always gotten along, but you know what? I look at them, and to be able to look at them and to know that they know my experience, they respect me, they respect my work, I felt I had community surrounding me. I felt I had community surrounding me when I learned that an administrator, I'm trying my best not to mention names, but some of these people are no longer here, said after she gave me, uh, I call it a paper position because it was only for political reasons, give a black person anything of power and they'll do whatever you want. And like, Everybody here, I came in with excellent credentials. I came in with awards. Then a fellowship came up. <laughs> this is, this is, there was one person who went before Sean and I went to Rutgers, New Brunswick, because I had done coursework toward the degree in literature at NYU, but I was the main wage earner in moving to South Jersey. I couldn't travel back to New York. I hadn't finished. I didn't know how to do things then, like get an independent study and that sort of stuff, because most of us come from families where we don't have people who had gone through college. Mm -hmm. We were the, the mm -hmm. mavericks, first the groundbreakers, the first ones, mm -hmm. okay? because somebody could have said, Linda, you could do that. But anyway, they, they had a fellowship at Rutgers, New Brunswick for minority faculty in the state who didn't have the, yet have the terminal degree and it was for people in science. So I looked at Sean, she looked at me, we said social science is science. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew I had studied a great deal of linguistics so I applied to anthropological linguistics, and hence, I've been an anthropologist for, I don't know, what, 90, 30 years, 25 years, whatever, okay? One of the, uh, and so, you know, the, so many, the problems that I've had with faculty Standing in my way, when I tried to do things that other people, particularly white men, had done, I had people, all I could think about, some of you read 
Invisible Man. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you know, he was running around with that suitcase that the, that the head of that university gave him, and he said, when you get to New York, give him this letter, they'll give you a job. Got to New York, opened up the letter, and said, keep this nigga running. That was how I felt when I went for the experience that I wanted. Other people transferred from one division to another and back again. Mm -hmm. I came back with my PhD in anthropology and an exceptional dissertation and et cetera, et cetera. So I said, I want to go into anthropology because I wanted to teach anthropology even though I loved teaching writing and was good at it. But what happened was, I look at my CV now, my resume, and I have 14 courses that I taught over the time here at Stockton, most of which I wrote myself, because in order for me to teach anthropology, I had to teach anthropology as a writing course. And you know how labor intensive that, mm -hmm. that was. Mm -hmm. So here we are, I've got the PhD, I'm finished, and lo and behold, People are moving back and forth. The experience that I had with my dean mm. and the then vice president when I went and said, first of all, I went and interviewed at DePaul University in Chicago and was offered the job on the spot and came back and told my dean, and he said, oh yeah, by the way, that was going to be in discourse analysis, communication department, doing the things that I know how to do with that PhD. And he sat back and said, yeah, and they'll have you there two years and you'll be teaching basic writing again. Wow. Many times, as much as I didn't, wouldn't want to admit it, I drove home to my house in Sickleville, which I bought up in Sickleville because somebody told me there were two things that I desperately needed, sidewalks and Negroes. <laughs> 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 there were sidewalks and a, a, it was a beautifully integrated community. Yeah. But there were some people there who looked like me. And so I said, okay, I'll drive the 40 minutes up. I'll do it. But I would drive up crying because I couldn't understand. I don't know if perhaps some of my brothers and sisters here were more um, cynical than me. I was trusting, trusting that my worth would be validated. <laughs> There's so much more. There's so much more. And I shall say that I ended up, I went into Anthro in 2005. I retired in 2014. And what I experienced there, for now, I'd rather not say. Mm -hmm. I'd rather not say. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Y'all about to make me say. cry. <laughs> yeah. I got tears in my eyes over here. I, yeah. I have well, one, and I can, I, just one more thing. Can I say something after Adele real quick? Well, me first. I, me first. Oh, I, I just want to say one oh, thing. After Linda. Because after Adele. the position that I was fighting to get as an already tenured faculty member who was trying to do what I saw mm -hmm. more than one person do, mm -hmm. that was absurd that I should think that I could do that. That is, okay, yeah, move me to ch And so when it was not offered to me, but distinctly offered to somebody else, I had to muster up stuff that's not so always so easy for me to muster up, and that stank. Plain mm. old mean fight. Mm. So I threatened that I would fight to the end if somebody else got that position in Ant beside me, who was junior to me, not mm. full time, mm. et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was awarded that position. 
and then they had an opportunity to treat me like a second class citizen. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. Until I retired in 2014. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if anybody else has had this experience, and I don't think so, but um, one of the faculty members on my faculty tried to get me detenured. What? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, oh, I, I think most of you didn't know this. No, what? Um, I knew it. Um, damn. Yeah, uh, I, I had... <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, well, I wasn't. Um, I had a child. And um, I was an older person when I had this child, oh Lord. And I got postpartum depression. And I was not as good as I had always been, but I was struggling and I was mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And I um, walked around with lint in my hair, I remember that. One of the students said, I, 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 I was a mess. <laughs> Poor baby. Now I'm on the nursing faculty, health professionals. Not one person on that faculty came to my side and said, Adele, are you all right? They went behind me to try to get me detenured. It did work, because my dean at that time said, do you know what they're trying to do? And she put me on to, you know, what was going on. And even at the time, you know, I was, I was getting help. But the fact that the person who was the mental health person in nursing was the one who was trying to get a position and the only way she felt she could get the position was to get me out of the way. Mm. That was dirty stuff. If she's no longer with us. Yeah. You see, you see the, what you have to appreciate is that uh, the tenure numbers at Stockton was very low. Yeah. And every time you got tenure, you're talking about infusing yourself and your family with millions of dollars. So that's what you were fighting for. There's millions of dollars. And they were, they were, this was like a cult. Mm -hmm. That's a good word to describe mm -hmm. Stockton back then, a cult. Mm -hmm. And if you weren't a member of the cult, you couldn't hang, you couldn't play. So if you wanted to survive, and when I came here, I'll tell you a quick story. A dude who was playing with Aretha, James Brown, uh, he was a violist, and uh, he was killing him. And he was also a bodacious brother. And he was building a house, and he showed everybody his crib, and he was making chabos, money. And uh, he got tenured. They messed with him and messed with him and messed with him, and he got tenured. The day the board said, bang, you, uh, we passed your tenure, he went into the office and slapped somebody that just bitch slapped somebody. <laughs> 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 this is my first time hearing this story. What else could happen to that. <laughs> He didn't know so that, Franklin. That's why he told me to go home. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. Because wow. I was on the verge. <laughs> and I tried to hip the dude. I tried to tell him, you shouldn't have done that, man. Wait until the second day of back to school, and then you cool, then whip him. But he did it, and they took the tenure away. Mm. They took the tenure away. Yeah. But that's the kind of tension that was here. But I wasn't waiting for no folk from here to tell me who Franklin Smith is. That's right. Mm -hmm. I was a bad dude before I got here. And I was yeah. an, I grew up in South Bronx, born on a plantation in South Carolina. Go. I, who gonna punk me at, uh, at a place like this? <laughs> Not just intellectually, but we could go outside too. <laughs> this is why we love him, okay? I we follow that man. <laughs> I, I, I tell I, you, I, I, Cla my but, class, remember what I told y'all about call and response? That deserved the amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I know. But you That's know, we've right. been doing a lot of call and response. You hear us going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And, I just want to say something when you guys get finished. Go ahead. I just want to give a shout out. But go ahead. No, I just want to make sure I, I do make one thing finishes. very, very clear. I spent my first how many years? 81 shucks to like nine, uh, 12 years or so at least. More than that, oh my God, 81 to 2004, 2005 in the writing program. 
And it would be really remiss if I were not to say that in that program, I was embraced, respected by my colleagues who are still my dear, dear friends, okay? Regardless of race yeah. and color. That was a sanctuary and that was probably part of the reason why coming out of there, I was not prepared for what I would face outside of there. I wanted to give a shout out. Can I go right on the heels of Linda, please? Because I wanted to give a shout out to, uh, I think Linda made a good point. I can certainly talk about the performing arts program, can I? Because y'all know us through music and stuff. Uh, certainly there's been strong, wonderful support in our programs, all right? And I appreciate that. But I could not sit in this auditorium, y'all without giving a shout out to student development, especially to my soar and friend who has been in Stockton almost as long as I have. We worked hand in hand. So many things I would not know about and would not be able to do if it were not for Diane Stalling. All right. And I could not sit here. Girl, we're talking about faculty having our back. But Diane, you are amazing. And thank you for being I just wanted to give a shout out. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Can, I, can I ask you all to talk a little bit about the, the challenges or struggles you may have faced in fusing blackness into the curriculum? Oh. <laughs> Are you <laughs> sure you Because the classes, that? you know, they uh -huh. started with you. So I want to hear well, something I can, about that. I can tell That's you one, one thing. Um, as a sociologist, I and have I you. have really been trained about intersectionality, race, class, and gender. Mm -hmm. And I don't even read student comments anymore because some of them are so offensive. Um, people would say things like, all she talks about is black people and Hispanics and um, women. And that was a negative comment. Uh, why does she tell us about things that we're not tested on? Uh, where does she get her degree from? You know, so there was always pushback if you really tried to diversify the curriculum. Not to mention the fact that if I, like I teach, I ta taught intro for many years in the classroom. And I'm now accustomed to people coming in the classroom, whether it's a hybrid or not, sitting down. And when I come in the classroom, they walk out. Oh, yeah. That's a commonality. At first, I was really surprised, but now I just take it. My check's the same whether they walk out or not. <laughs> Go, Sean. You know, Sean, you know what that reminds me of? My la last time I taught senior seminar, in, Afri in African American studies, 4,000 level course. All students have to take a 4,000 level. And as the years went by, we had um, a distribution of students racially. And most of the time, students came in enthusiastic to learn. But some students really came in thinking, hey, it's a black course, this ain't nothing. And there are two, I, can, I can't even tell you how many examples I have, but there are two that stand out, and I'll try to make it tight. And I, I wanted them particularly, your, your, your daughter was in my class, mm -hmm. okay? And um, I'll, th that has a significance. <laughs> she was a great student, but that's not the significance. So this one student, a young black male, Okay, I can't see women stand up. <laughs> what? And we were talking about <clears throat> he did not believe he challenged every single thing. Of course I used texts by leading scholars. Of course everything was very well researched and documented, but he challenged everything. Everything. I and uh, years ago. Because I got a little old in this teaching profession. In the old days when I wore my hair in braids coming down like this and overalls and, I, and earth shoes, I was hip. <laughs> I was really hip, okay? But I was, I was in my 20s and 30s and I was from New York. And when I came here, I was still Linda, but then very, not too slowly, 
I became Dr. Nelson. Whoa. And I insisted upon being called doctor or professor. Everybody in my class knew that. Many of them had taken other classes with me. One day I walk in and this same young man who's sitting like this, so Linda, how was your weekend? And <laughs> the students who all I could hear, I put my head down like this to collect myself and all I could hear was, oh no he didn't. <laughs> oh, I, I know he didn't. And so I collected myself and I put my head up and I said, my students call me Professor Nelson or Dr. Nelson, not Linda. My response was a smirk. But, and this is one of the not so often, but often enough to make you believe that there is hope. At the, it was eight students in the class. It was a write-in eval. And so, you know, you just want to read them neutrally, but I could tell that this came from this young man. When I first walked into this class, I didn't believe anything. But this course has changed my life. One of the, th you know, that happens. That has happened a few times. Yeah. But then so many times I was asked, I was told, like probably many of us, especially in my language and power class where I'm talking about black vernacular and trying to talk about the structure of language and all human discourse that communicates in a group is a language. You're just here because of affirmative action. And of course, you know something? There's so many ways to respond to that. <laughs> There's so many ways. I could have said yes like the 300 years of white male affirmative action. I didn't say that. Instead, I said something that was much more defensive. I said, well, actually I'm here because I was at the top of almost every class I've ever been in, which was at least three quarters of a, two quarters of a lie. And he just looked at me. It goes on. There is no end to the stories that I could share with you folks. Can I, Linda, please, yes, just sir. for a second? Yes, sir. We, we used to, um, there were always gripes. People sitting around, I remember sitting around in the, in the cafeteria, used to be a cafeteria in G-Wing, and, and black folks sitting there griping, 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 oh, they treating me bad, yada buddha, bada bitty. And then we had a council, and maybe Will will fill us in. And we organized a council of black faculty and staff mm -hmm. so we could have a collective voice. And the first person we honored, and it's the beginning of the, 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 mm -hmm. that dinner, the council dinner, was Henry Bass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was a, a member of the Board of Trustees. <clears throat> and if you're playing with a cult and they got the rifles, you got to get some rifles too. So. We honored Henry and had a coalition with Henry. Henry had a coalition with other people on the board, and then we could dance. And that's how that wave that they talked about earlier on when the invasion came at Henry's insistence because he put Will in charge and Will put that package together. But we stopped just, you know, bitching about this and that and all of this discrimination. And, and, and I'm going to let Will jump in in a minute, but I got to names are coming to my head. Those young black faculties, particularly female, who were spit on, walked out of their classes crying in the parking lots mm -hmm. and saying, and, and Franklin, they won't do it to you, but they'll do it to me. They won't do it to you, because they know what'll happen, they do that, bring, <laughs> come at me with that. I'm from North Philadelphia. I, I never had that experience either. <laughs> I, I really didn't, but go ahead. But I'm talking about the way yeah, before they, you well, got here. Before I got here. Oh, okay. Ten years before you arrived. Oh, okay. You know, this was a, a wicked place, and you had to survive. <coughs> Excuse me, please. And one of the tools of our survival was when we put that council together. 
-hmm. The Council of Black Faculty, faculty and Staff. And staff. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it still has that political no. No. vigor no. now, it no. but it's back then, yeah, would back you then. touch that, please? Um, <laughs> the Council of Black Faculty and Staff was very significant. The rest of the college didn't know what we were doing, but we knew what we were doing in terms of organizing. Every person that we put as head of the Council of Black Faculty and Staff, guess what, got tenure. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. we, put that, we put our hands on them. We were sending a clear message to the faculty and staff and the president, hands off. And everyone who served as president absolutely. got tenure. That's absolutely true. So let's go back to this affirmative action. I might know a little bit about affirmative action because I wrote the affirmative action policy in 1979. Let me say that again. You say that again. I wrote the affirmative action policy in 1979 go, because okay. there wasn't an affirmative action policy. And Henry Bass Henry? was a, a titan, but he needed a policy. And it's been the affirmative action uh, committee has been working since 70 or 71, 72. Nothing passed. Mm -hmm. Nothing passed. I got on the affirmative action committee in 1978 and got an affirmative action policy that became effective in 1979. If you go back and look at black faculty and staff from 1979, you'll see their induction to Stockton in 1980, 1981, 1982, right. 1983, 1984, 1985, 1986. Mm -hmm. We got a little problem in 87, 88 because it kind of, what substituted affirmative action, and you're gonna recognize this, Affirmative action wasn't, you know, the theme anymore. It was diversity. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can't talk about African Americans. We've got to talk about diversity. And that meant everybody else mm -hmm. from all over the world. And those figures, you, you say, diversify 17%, you know, are minorities. How many of them are African Americans? If you look around, how many of them come from, I, we begrudge no one because we welcomed everyone here. If you look at the, the black faculty and staff, we welcomed everyone. And originally, it was black faculty and staff that included Latinos, Hispanics. Mm -hmm. the Filipinos, too. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, in terms of infusion, you know, into the curriculum, 25 years ago, I introduced black power mm -hmm. <laughs> without an apology. And people came to me and some very high-ranking administrators came to me and said, well, do you want to reconsider the title of your course? <laughs> nope. You want, to, you want to make it less aggressive? Well, you know what the answer was. That course is still being taught today. Black power. And I had the same problem in my class as others have had. Because I would get somebody to stand up and say, you know, why is it black this and black that? You know, women have similar problems. And I said, yeah, but that's another course. That's another course. This is black power about black people, about black experiences. Well, you know, Hispanics, and well, that's another course. It really is another course. Uh, gays and, oh, that's another course. <laughs> you want to neutralize or diminish what I'm trying to do here is about the contributions significant contributions that black people have made to this country and to the planet. And I used to give out assignments to students. And I, last year, my car was ran into in the parking lot of a gym while I'm watching it being run into. Um, so I had to go in and uh, rent a car. And the woman came up to me and she said, black power. Yep. <laughs> Got me. <laughs> so I said to her, if you had my class, you had an assignment, a written assignment and an oral assignment, because I gave each student two people, at least two people to research that they were unaware of. She said, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, one they just did a movie about. One they just did a movie about. She was in Hidden Figures. My, my classmate, undergraduate. Really? <laughs> All right. Everybody knows everybody. So what I'm saying to you is about black people, it, 
It was about the black family. It was about, about black achievement. Let me one quick story in terms of the miseducation <laughs> of not only the Negro, but the miseducation of people in general. I returned to Stockton for uh, the union uh, dinner that they had. And I'm in line uh, to get a plate. And the guy in front of me did not know me. And he turns to me and he says, what do you teach? And I said, black power. Many of you might not know, the last five years I was here, that's the only course I taught, six times a year. Mm -hmm with a waiting list. So he says to me, oh, black power, you teach about uh, Michael Jordan. <laughs> I said, no, I don't, I don't teach about Mike Jordan. I said, uh, let me ask you a question. You know who Steve Jobs was? Oh yeah, of course, Steve Jobs. I said, do you know uh, who Bill Gates is? Of course, I know Bill Gates. I said, what about Mark Dean? He said, I don't know Mark Dean. And I'll tell you right now, it wouldn't have been a Steve Jobs, it wouldn't have been a Bill Gates, if it wasn't for Mark Dean. Owns three of the original patents on a personal computer. The man created a disc about the size of a plate. You ready for this? Three billion computations per second. The guy that I was talking to, you know what he taught? Computers. Computer science. <laughs> computer science. How much has the person computer meant to the world's economy? And most of you don't even know his name. It's true that. Mark Dean. Don't believe me, because what I do, have I taught? I have students look it up. Look it up. Yeah. Just like my mother has told me to look it up. I used to ask her how to spell a word, and she say, look it up. Well, that's kind of tough, you're seven years old, and you're trying to look up a word you don't know how to spell. <laughs> now, I'm in school, it's second grade, and I'm writing my address. And I have problems with Philadelphia. <laughs> so I asked my mother, how do you spell Philadelphia? She said, look it up. <laughs> I, I was an hour in F's. <laughs> Philadelphia. That was Where do you get that PH was from? Good. That was good. And can you imagine for a child go to the psychopedia, I mean the dictionary, and look up psychology? <laughs> Same problem, right? Some schools taught it, teach you about silent letters and some don't. <laughs> and the ones that teach you about silent letters have an advantage, don't they? And the ones that don't teach you about silent letters, you're at a disadvantage. That tells you about education, the importance of education. One more thing about affirmative action and the reason for affirmative action. Affirmative action was needed because you were qualified and you were still being denied. That's right. That's right. That That's needs right. to be emphasized that, 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 so there you go. much. It was for those who were qualified and still being denied. Mm -hmm. And since affirmative action, and like I said, it's been diminished because of, of diversity. But look at what the impact it had, not only for the ones that taught, but look at the thousands of students they did have an opportunity to teach and take advantage of what they had to offer. That's right. You know, and it, it's worth saying, and as the news has just revealed, that people with money have bought their children places in college not just this year and not just movie stars, but for years. Yes. Moreover, affirm, you don't get in <coughs> under affirmative action if you don't know anything and don't qualify. Another thing, just quickly, about affirmative action is that when you are take, my daughter went to school in New England. And there were affirmative action white students there from Missouri. Because not too many students came out of Missouri and went to Brown. You know? Um, Alaska. Places where white students, not black students. So affirmative action is to make an affirmative effort for people who've been denied 
in case of people of color, black people, as well as people who just would not have a chance to move in that direction. That's right. That's, right. That's a really important piece to understand. Yeah, the other piece about affirmative action, um, <clears throat> affirmative action also included women. Mm -hmm. And women have taken a great deal of advantage of affirmative mm -hmm. action. Yes. But with respect to Stockton, you, you know, you have to negotiate and you have to compromise and you have to make uh, alliances. The problem that African Americans had in 1978 and 79 was that we were not here. The problem that women were having, particularly white women were having here at Stockton, there was not one white woman or woman who was a full professor. What? Not one. Not one. In 1978, 1979. And they were passing out those promotions like they were candy. So here it goes. I'm making a deal. You work with me to get African Americans here, I'll work with you to get women promoted to full professorships. Because once you get a certain number of professors, then it locks them, the rest of you out. Mm -hmm. And they were handing them out to white males. You know, there's one other thing, just quickly, about teaching courses, because all of us here taught in Africana studies. Um, First of all, there's a myth that has to be dispelled that when you come into Africana studies, you're going to be le uh, learning some watered down something. <laughs> so when you ask people to do serious research and then they're reading materials that are difficult to understand, that they have to come close and explicate, they are concerned. But also what I discovered was I taught a course called um, Literature of multicultural literature. So there was literature by Native Americans, by Jewish Americans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there were about, in my course, three readings by African Americans. And one of the comments on the um, student evals was, I took a course in multicultural literature. I didn't take a course in African American literature. This whole course was about African American literature. We tend to get really, really big when we show up anywhere where we've been absent. This, before the affirmative action program, I was on the personnel committee, and we needed a new dean. And the guy who applied for the deanship was the uh, son of a uh, former UN Ambassador Ralph Bunch. Mm. Hmm. And he was already a dean in the uh, City College of New York. Uh -huh. He applied. We said no to him and uh, appointed a dean who had no administrative uh, experience. Mm -hmm. Was there a need for affirmative action here? And you all know who Ralph Bunch was. You know who Ralph Bunch was. No, 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 no. Look it up. <laughs> look it up. You better tell them, Franklin. I ain't telling them. Oh, look it they up. Got, look it they up. got a thousand dollar computer in, in, <laughs> right in their pocket. <laughs> they got their phones, right? You know, when people you ask about the Nobel okay. Peace Prize, okay. they wanted to know who won the Nobel Peace Prize, and people will say absolutely Martin Luther King. And people know that uh, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize. Guess who else won a Nobel Peace Prize? Mm -hmm. What was the second one you said? You, what'd you say after Obama? I didn't say anything after Obama. Oh, well. Okay. <laughs> I did too. I, we, Ralph Punch. Ralph Punch. Oh, yeah, yeah. that was him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we, oh, yeah. okay. okay. we have some uh, audience questions yeah, let's now, get if you don't questions. mind. Yeah, <laughs> what, yeah. Where, are we yeah, going to talk about African kind of studies at all? Let's. Sure, he's about to ask a question about it, okay. actually. Oh, OK. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank for laying the foundation for us. I'm listening, it's really sad because when I was hired, excuse my language, I went through the same bullshit. And we're talking 25, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. I hate to curse, but listening to you, you're about to cry, I'm getting angry, my blood is boiling, and nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I want to question, uh, you asked, are you, uh, Linda, you discussed the student who yeah. challenged you. Was it a black or white student? It was a white male. Okay. Mm -hmm. The question I have is, I teach in the School of Education and I teach in Africana Studies. In my education classes, normally, I always know I'm only going to have two to five minority students. Minority meaning black and Latino. Mm -hmm. So when I started teaching Africana Studies, I got excited. I'm going to have more black students. 
and also enjoy white students who want to learn about our culture. What challenges do you have with black students? Because uh. <laughs> I love my black students, I love my peoples, but sometimes I want to choke them. Yes. <laughs> what challenges do you have? Oh gosh, with that's your black a, students? I, it's so important that you brought that up because that really is on the list of challenges that we face as African American faculty. There are two kinds of challenges that I've met in the classroom by black students. Hmm. One is the, I don't know who the hell she thinks she is, challenge, um, where one student, her last name was something like Wherewood. It wasn't a difficult name to pronounce, but she corrected me three times in a row in the same sentence. I said, I'm making this up now. Sandra Wherewood, Wherewood. Sandra, okay, Sandra Wherewood, Wherewood. Sandra Wherewood, Wherewood. I said, okay, you know what? You come after class and you tell me how to pronounce it because we're not spending any more time on this. That's one thing. And another thing that is very, very difficult is sometimes black students think because you're black, you are going to let them slide. <laughs> and they say, come on now, you know, you know, you know, you know why you are not gonna get a break? Everybody gets a break when they need a break. Grandma really died, you know? You really came down with a serious illness. I'm not stringent on that experience at all. But because you're black, you're gonna get a break? No, you're gonna come into my office and sit down, and I'm gonna do my best to teach you, but you're gonna get a C or a D or an A after we do our best to learn the material because that is a, that is really a JIT job that you do to your students. If you are black or Latino or Latinx and you take, you're, you're teaching somebody from your group or Asian and they expect something special because you share the same background, you're cheating them. And the world is not gonna give them a break. And so for you to give them a break are, is a right. disservice. And you're saying, I don't really believe you can do this. And that's not true. I believe they can do this. Hmm, good point. So yeah, oh I, yes. I think I in um, Africana studies, um, we pride ourselves in requiring excellence from our students. Fine. And I think across exactly. the board, we have very high standards, and if you don't meet them, you get what you earn in the class, no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. And whatever your expectations are when you come into the class, you should know by week one, before drop at, that that is the standard that we're gonna hold you to in all of our classes. And we take great pride in the fact that we've moved from a minor to a major, and we are not playing. I would like to, can I just jump in before you ask your question, Betty, real quick? I used to just bust them. <laughs> you used to do what? What did you say? It, I bust them. Bust them. Oh. If you know, you say you like your people, then you know how to pull the chain of your people. Yes. And I'll pull that chain in a minute. Come wobbling in the class, showing me the crack in their behind, yeah. pants down. I ain't playing that, man. Yeah. See, I'm like Franklin. There were no caps in my class. You did not wear a do-rag. No. Mm -hmm. You did not come to my class late because I would lock the door. CP time? No, yeah, there was no such thing as CP time. And you didn't time. come in smelling like ganja. That, that, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I should I, be doing I, that. I, I should, I, I, I think I'm a start. Beloved <laughs> starting, students starting Tuesday. from my community who I knew and loved, home in Sickleville, come in my class late, smelling like herb, ganja, marijuana, whatever you want to call it. And I'd say, turn around. <laughs> Go on. Sleep it off. 
Um, <laughs> getting back, but I know earlier when we had um, smaller numbers, the numbers grew and grew and grew of black students on campus, many of us became, I guess, surrogate parents. Mm -hmm. We became um, older siblings, mm -hmm. and we really mentored our students. And Africana Studies also served that purpose to mm -hmm. teach folks what they didn't know. And um, as, as the program grew, we saw fewer and fewer, you know, less and less of that. And we saw that, and my experience was, I would see people and they say, well, I don't want to take Africana Studies. So um, it, 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 it goes both ways. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, some yeah. of the students were um, just eager. I, I remember students that took every single class I offered. And others who wouldn't dare, yeah. dare, too hard. Because That's we were right. too challenging. That's well, right. I'm going to go on and speak. Yeah. My colleagues have butted in every time I said, ugh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I just want to speak on that real quick. Uh, I'm teaching in performing arts, which is a little different. We're all on a high academic level, but certainly in performing arts. And I want to speak to the music of African Americans. How many of you guys have been in that class? And that class, historically, guys, started off predominantly white. Having a minority in that class was strange. However, as the years have gone by, now it's like half and half. It's wonderful because everybody is expected to do the same exercise. Everybody is expected to make this African circle. Everybody is expected to feel like they're picking cotton. Everybody is expected to do this. Every, because we want to have this kind of experience. And I got some witnesses in here. We're going to point you out because we want you to have that wonderful kind of experience. As I talk about the performing arts program too, I was shouting when, when Donnie, came to the, to the Faculty of Arts and Humanities because we were lily white except for me and Wendell. And as time goes by, I just want to point out that this year, the first time in the performing arts faculty, just let me say this one more time, this year, the first time in theater, dance, or music, we have an African American. He's in the audience right now. I'm so glad, Aaron, and what he represents, because that's the way we're reaching out to our faculty. Now, the last thing I want to say is that what do we do? Bev, what do you do for your classes in performing arts? Every class that I teach, every choir that I have, I don't care whether we're singing Handel, I don't care whether we're singing Brahms, uh-oh, I'm beginning to talk super black now, I don't care what we're singing, we're going to sing something African American in this class. Whether I'm talking about choirs, I'm talking about community choirs, I'm talking about performances. We're going to do this little light of mine. We're going to do I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. We're going to do something that's black from my heritage in that class. Why? Because I think it's important that I affirm who I am. I believe that our, my music, our music has something to offer. And last but not least, I believe that we as African American faculty have an opportunity. And it's American music. Uh-oh. And, it and it has said so many other forms of American music. Well, I, like I said, my colleague, go girl. And I agree with her 100%. But we have something to offer. And also we have an opportunity as African-American faculty members to be that mentor. My colleagues, I'm sure we all done that studies about when we had predominantly all black schools, all black HBS, how much it did in terms of affirming our students. And when we're at a predominantly white institution, we have an example to be role, an opportunity to be role models and to be that surrogate encouragement. We don't take no mess, but we have that opportunity, and that's what I just wanted to throw that out. All right. Uh oh, uh oh, uh -oh. Uh -oh. I'm really glad I was able to get here today. I got a rush to my AC class now, but I'm glad that I was able to get here to say hello to all of you. I'm proud to have known all of you over the years and embarrassed by what you went through, of which I was ignorant. I apologize on behalf of Stockton for what happened to you. But I thank you. Great, great knowing you. And I hope you keep coming back. This could be an annual event. Can Go I say something before Betty leaves? Um, when we did Africana Studies, I was, I was the chairperson of the person that, I mean, that um, got the program when it was the certificate, before it was even a minor. Um, and our faculty assembly, because it was an academic program, had to approve any program that was going on for the next year. And we wanted to start in September. Betty was the moderator of the faculty assembly at that time. Okay. And we were finally ready with our proposal in May. 
Most of the time, faculty assembly did not have too many May meetings because everybody wanted to leave. But I, I just begged Betty, and I pushed Betty, and she had that meeting, and we dug up a quorum, <laughs> and we passed it. So Betty was one of the people, one of the pivotal people who helped us um, get Africa. So Betty, Betty! <laughs> Betty! Hello, everybody. Hey, Jim. Hello. I just want to um, say this, because this goes outside of the curriculum. I took, I took a picture of you guys, and I, I said, hey, SSC family, look at the legendary lineup. And for those who are not here, they, went, they, they wouldn't understand what I mean by SSC, because that has a special meaning for us. You guys went well past the curriculum. Most of us that were here, I got here in 1986, and most of us who got here who were black came by EOF. And we rarely saw anybody that looked like you guys. And the standard that you held for us, you didn't play with us, you held us to a standard, and we are thankful to this very day because my phone is blowing up from people from SSC that's like, wow, that was my professor, Frank, Will. And I mean, they're like, going, they're like wishing they was here. And I'm having this surreal moment because I said to them, I am because of you guys. And I'm looking at Donnie and I'm looking at um, Darrell Cleveland and he teaches black power. And I'm looking at the fact that you guys Look at your professors you have now who are teaching in Africana Studies, because one day, hopefully, you'll be privileged enough to look at this panel and look at them and say, wow, they made me. And that's how we felt. That old guard of Stockton felt like you guys made us. So thank you for laying the groundwork. Thank you for what you put up with. And even though we're still putting up with it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. John, we still teaching. No. Okay, okay, I know you're talking about legacy. But thank you for what you're still, still putting up with. Daddy, I ain't changing your grade. But there you go. Thank you. And because you guys really were our surrogate parents. And, and I got a funny story with Frank. I remember when I got branded. I'm a member of Iota Phi Theta. There you go. And I got branded. And, and Frank would just blast you anywhere. He just, he just blast you. And I remember this loud voice Hey, boy, plow my field. And I'm like, Frank, why are you doing this to me in front of everybody? Because mm -hmm. he wanted me to get the significance of what I did to myself mm -hmm. by getting branded. I just thought it was some cool stuff to do. And now I'm 50 looking at these brands on my arm saying, wow, really? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had thought differently. But from the bottom of my heart, my Stockton experience, I felt like I was in an HBCU, even though I was here in the woods in South Jersey. And coming from Newark and not having anybody that looked like you with your background, intelligence, and passion for this, I thank you. And that's what I carry with me while I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. And we are so proud of you, Assistant Dean of the School of Education. We are so proud of you, John. Dr. Gray. Go, that's go. right. Let me add, because Dr. he Gray. didn't say who he was. Dr. John Gray, who is Assistant, assistant Dean, dean. Um, wow. of the School of Education and alumni. From Stockton. Bravo, bravo. Oh, we to say something. Oh. Ah, por <laughs> It is just, I, I, I don't have words. Oh, I, I, am, I, I probably am going to cry. It is so exciting to see all of you up there. Adele, because I haven't seen you Adele. in forever. And I remember that detenuring nonsense. <laughs> I remember that. Franklin who I will always remember as the person who called my child Colorado, which means red, by the way, if you don't know. He's still red. <laughs> you and I, who engaged in that dark behavior of smoking outside in K-Wing, but boy, did we have wonderful conversations. <laughs> My beautiful Sean, we had our babies at the same time. Yeah, our babies Both. are the same age. Wow. Both oh yeah, we were. Yep, we went through it. <laughs> I don't know what was going on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> my wonderful Beverly. Uh oh. Oh my goodness, oh, Beverly, you. Hermosísima, tú. You are. I mean, every time she sees me. 
Hola. ¿Cómo estás? ¿Cómo estás? <laughs> Because she is fluent in everything. Oh, oh, God bless you. God bless you. <laughs> and I love and adore you. Oh, you. Yeah. Linda, my goodness. I, I mean, again, I don't have the words. Always there to support me. Always, always, always my role model, the person I wanted to follow, I wanted to be like. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Now the bad you. part. <laughs> We can have a Puerto Rican panel like this. Mm. Good point, yes. good point, good point. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. That was call and response. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No Puerto Rican panel like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just, just a, a, well, yeah, it could, it could be me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's it. 32 years later. Yes. Still just me. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. I taught Puerto Rican history and culture my first semester here. Mm -hmm. Sex discrimination in the law, my first semester here, the two courses I created. Mm -hmm. Still, I'm the only one teaching them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's a problem. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. And just anecdotally, I'll say, when I first started, I was asked to teach beginning Spanish too. Mm. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> The last time I took a Spanish class, I was in high school. Mm. <laughs> I would probably be better prepared to teach English. I wonder if they would ask me to teach an English class. Mm. Good What do you think? Good point. Good point. You think I would be tapped for that? Whoa. Well, you know, we need, we need an English composition class. Mm -hmm. I think you might be qualified to teach that, but somehow they thought, well, she must be qualified to teach Spanish. And I would like to also comment mm -hmm. that this battle continues to this day, and I know what Arlene has been through as the only Hispanic. Right. People mm -hmm. questioning whether she can write or speak yes. English correctly. And she's mm -hmm. a lawyer. Yes. Mm -hmm. In her department. Oh, yeah. Yes. So these yes. kinds of things are not from the 80s or the 90s. We're talking 21st century discrimination or at the job site, and it mm -hmm. continues. Our institution is nothing but a microcosm of the bigger society. The conservatism mm -hmm. that has been you know, stamped and approved mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. highest office uh -huh. in this land, continues in this institution right now. Mm -hmm. So I right. always will support Arlene and her struggle and other faculty members mm -hmm. who go through these microaggressions on a regular basis. Wow. So I just want to tell you, I got your wow. back, Arlene. Uh -oh. I know you, you do. All of you, all of you have. All of you have. And you know who else had my back? Dr. Vera King Ferris. Yes. Dr. Vera King Ferris. Vera King Ferris. Yeah. I would not be here, I'm going to cry, yeah. Uh, yeah. without her. Arlene, And can, me I, neither. can I me neither. ask you a question? I'm sorry? I think I'm going to ask you a question because. Oh, I, yes, I'm please, go somewhat, ahead, Will. Somewhat troubled. Uh, yeah. When I was president of the faculty, mm -hmm. uh, a number of people came to me and asked to get through the faculty assembly a Latin and Caribbean studies program. Yes. Which got through. Yes, it did. With the hope that it would attract more <laughs> Latino faculty. Yes. And here we are now. That was in 89, 90. Yeah, yeah. When we 90. passed that. Yep. So we, 89, yeah, 90 when we you passed and Arnaldo, that. too? Yeah. Yes. Arnaldo and I yeah. and, are the Puerto Ricans. Yeah. I, I think Javier, Javier. Oh, Javier. But, but women? But Javier is, but the, but I'm, the right. Right. I'm the only one. I'm the only woman. Well, that's the other question I have because <laughs> I got beat up a little bit when I was dean. I hired a woman, first one in social work, mm -hmm. uh, Latino, and I had actually uh, bumped her salary up a little higher than mm -hmm. what normal faculty came in as an assistant professor. Mm -hmm. And she was still challenging me about more money. And wow. I asked her, Who are you talking to? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> <laughs> So when I found out who she was talking to, <laughs> I went to Arlene and I said, Arlene, I have to tell you this. I've already given her two steps above 
what I normally give, and I can't go any higher. And Arnie said, okay. <laughs> okay. But, but I still remember that you didn't give me more. <laughs> but just to put it in today's terms, last week I was asked, after serving on a panel like this, Oh, you did a beautiful job. Does it bother you when somebody calls you doctor? Mm. What? Somebody asked you that? Yes. Okay. And I was taken a, last week. No, it was so not you. And then that was followed up a little bit later with, you know, you, unprompted, of course, you shouldn't be ashamed of your degree. What? What? Uh, what? Last week. What? Mm. Wow. I want to curse. I, I have responded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Last week. Last week. Did they tell you why you should be ashamed? Well, no, of course not. Oh, why would they think you were ashamed? Why That's, I, I don't even understand well, what prompted the question. I'm not. Exactly. So. We know what that means. Oh, yeah. embarrassing. Y'all spell it out. Wow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just so, oh. Yes. Yeah. Hey. Almost 2020. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. But I don't want to end on that. Thank you. I love you all so much. We and love I thank you, you for, for being able to be here. Each Thank and every you. one of you. Gracias, Thank gracias. You. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias por todo. I wouldn't be Take here without you. Gracias por todo. And that is the God's honest truth. I mm. love you. Love you. Love you. Thank you. Love you know that day. you know that saying. Give them their flowers while they're here. So that's definitely what today is about. Because I wanted to honor these folks. Any other question in the audience? I'll bring it the mic. Oh, I've been knowing him all his life. Um. Okay. Good morning. I'm not sure. I could. Yeah, good morning. I good afternoon. Morning. <laughs> no, it's afternoon. Yeah, it's so Okay, afternoon. good afternoon. Um, tell me, tell us your name and what you do. That's Raymond Tyler. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Should I stand up too? Please. Uh, my name is uh, Raymond Tyler. Um, will you guys get mad if, at me if I say I'm not a doctor? Because <laughs> no, uh, I think everybody else who spoke was a doctor, so I'm, not, I'm the first no. one who's not. Okay. Um, a couple things, I'll, I'll be as brief as I, I possibly can. The first time me, my brother, and my family uh, came onto the campus of Stockton University, and we were lifelong Atlantic City residents, was when Beverly, Dr. Beverly Vaughn invited us to a performance of the Ebony Ensemble. Might have been the very first Which anniversary. Is now the, the highest praise gospel yes. choir. Oh. Yes, that's right. And our president, one of our vice presidents and, here. Thank um, you. Me, my brother and I still talk about that day. Oh, my father wow. and I talked about that day until wow. the day he passed. Wow, wow. Uh, that was our first time on campus here. Um, I'm embarrassed to say, other than Dr. Vaughn and Dr. Allison, did I get your name right? Because <laughs> I often mess up her name. Um, I'm not familiar with any of you, and I live in, I've lived in Atlantic City all my life. I wish I could have the, the current Atlantic City High School here with me because they need to see this. I was totally unaware of all of the stuff that you guys uh, put up with. Um, you know, on, on our behalf. And when I, the reason why I say on our behalf is because I had the, the privilege of being the first black columnist for Atlantic City Weekly. Mm -hmm. Getting there, <laughs> a story, mm -hmm. um, still after years and years of journalism going into places here in South Jersey mm -hmm. and saying I'm from this magazine or that magazine, they look at you like, well, we don't have no basketball courts here. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, you know, yeah. I thank you for, you know, for, mm -hmm. for the great work that you've done. And again, you know, apologies uh, for, for not knowing you better and for seeing some of you for the first 
first time. I guess if I have a question, it would be, uh, at this point in my life, a lot of times when I run into that, we don't have any basketball courts here, uh, especially uh, being a professional artist as well. Uh, I've tried to work with local organizations and gotten so frustrated. I don't have the wherewithal that you, that you ladies and gentlemen have to fight. I've just said, look, I've got resources, I've got friends, we've got money, we can start our own um, organization. But could you talk to me about the importance of staying and fighting even when you're tired and you don't feel like fighting anymore? <laughs> because of people like you. Because you're here and you can see examples. You have to be able to look in the door and see role models, see somebody who looks like you. It's very alienating to go into an institution and to try to be a part of an institution and see no one. Many of us went all through school. The, we used to say, just say, the only, or I used to say, the only spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's very difficult because it's difficult to build alliances, not impossible, and just to stand in front of somebody, sit in front of somebody who has made judgments about you, yeah. made judgments about you because of how you look. And, you, and sometimes you get so angry, you start, that's what happened to me once in class, what I was telling you about. You start spitting out your resume. It's stupid to do that. You know, it's embarrassing. But yeah, huh, huh, who? Don't you know who I am? You know, you get crazy. But you need to stick it out because not only that, what I discovered also, and I know this is about black faculty here at Stockton, but I found myself, without realizing it, being a role model for poor, white, Latina, Latino, and other folks who never would have gone to college. And so when they see you, they know it's possible. I've been a role model for black students primarily, but I've had enough other students, non-black, say, you really encouraged me. In honor of our Africana studies, let me share a little bit with you. I'm Gullah, and if you all <laughs> should be hip to who, what that is. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Look, Look it, it up. up. <laughs> uh, but you got to speak some Geechee, man. You yeah. got to speak a little Geechee. I got to speak Geechee. A little Geechee. Well, I knew my great-grandmother. Her mother was born in the enslavement. Mm -hmm. I was born on a plantation in Jim, under the Jim Crow system. What they taught me, son, I leave in off my head to land on your shoulder. You carry it your way. They take it off there, the responsibility from their head, they drop it on your shoulder, and in your time, you carry it forward. Ain't about being no pretty. I remember telling, uh, one of our famous alumni, when she walked in here out of Newark, you know, I said, I want you to be ugly for four years. Ugly up. Ugly up. And that comes from the enslavement. Pretty girls got raped. You got to keep them ugly and in big crocus sacks for as long as you can to keep that danger away from them. You take that responsibility from your people's head, they drop it to you. You got to carry it, otherwise, you're a punk. You can get all lost. You can get all lost in your individual needs. That ain't our way. See? You carry you know, it forward. So many of us did not come from money, didn't come from higher education. Like Franklin, I grew up in the South Bronx. My father was a third grade educated Mississippi sharecropper who used to sub-vocalize when he read. You know what that is? He used to read out loud when he was reading to himself. I read out loud now, and I, I advise yeah, yeah. everybody out there <laughs> to read out loud. It makes He's a now an actor. Yeah. No, I'm a voiceover actor. Yeah. yeah. Read out loud. Because <laughs> I'm going to speak after Linda. Yes. Go on and finish Girl, your point, well, And we were poor as hungry poor. Not you can't go to the movies. 
but what will we eat tomorrow for? Because my mother was an, one of them illegal immigrants. Mm. She was from Jamaica. And at the time, she was terrified that they would find out and send her back and she would be away from her children. But she took us to the library when we were four years old and made sure we knew how to write our name and get a library card and carry home the maximum. You've got six books, you're allowed seven, seven. And the eldest taught the next one, the five of us, all the way down, and mother said, you will pick up where I left off. And that's what is a lesson for all of us here. Don't take whatever you have for granted. And African Americans, we know this. We know this. We know somebody who is illiterate or who, my father, my greatest, I say this in public, but my, my greatest claim to fame is my father was AWAL from World War I. <laughs> because in, they, they would recruit, they would pull you off the chain, they, chain gangs and they'd, they'd pull you off the street yes, when sir. you stepped in the gut like you were supposed to and, and take you off. And so the fact that he got away, I'm proud of that piece of my history. So many of us who sit up here with our, should I call you doctor? Thank you. You don't know how far we've come, and you can too, all of you, if that's what you choose to do. I think we have I just one more. I just want to. I want to. I want to. Oh, yeah. Is I that want to, I want. May I just because I, I want because I'm following what Linda said. I, Linda, oh, we, are you finished yeah. your sentence, Linda? Because yeah. I just want to very quickly say how excited I am. My generation, we get a chance to carry the torch. And now, we, it, we all have, in the whole audience, we all have that same story. My father came out of Mississippi, too. Met my mother in Ohio. He only got a 10th grade education. He picked cotton at 10 years old. That's he right. made money. He was a bricklayer. His dream was to have a brick house and that his daughter and son could go to college. And that's what really happened. And now I'm at Stockton. He came to Stockton one time, and he cried when he saw me in front of a choir. He said, a dream came true. It was worth every brick that I laid. We all have the same story, but our generation gets a chance to carry that torch. But once the torch, we're passing it on to you. And it's just like Franklin and Linda said, that wonderful history grows and grows. And it's just not African Americans, no. but also as they That's say, right. the same story goes to Puerto Rico. The and same story goes to Italians. It's the same story, right? But we're talking about African Americans right now. This is an exciting time for us. So I, that's all I want to say is I'm holding my torch high as long as I can. That's exactly you, right. There's Richland is when here. Her, when her father came here. Do you remember that? Franklin? Yeah. Remember that? Oh. Yeah. Beautiful dude. A great storyteller. Yes, he was. And what I tell Beverly, he wasted all that money to try to get her subdued. <laughs> <laughs> All well, that money. And it was a waste of shit. Well, can we hear from Well, Richland? my father, my father was a hustler. Uh-oh. <laughs> he was a numbers runner. And Franklin Smith knew that as just started this position. And I'm, you know, I'm a doctor now. And I'm, a, I'm sitting up in Wing. Yes, he was. And he comes up to me, so so where are your people from? And as soon as I told them my town, who, what, are, what are the names? I told him the last name. He said, oh, I know your father. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's the story. But he would, I'm sure he's smiling down right now. Yeah. Um, I had when a question over here. We have to hear from Richland. Um, She's yeah. been standing for a while. I also question to Pedro and then Richland. <laughs> Pedro Santana, and I just wanted to say um, uh, thank you for sharing you know, the wonderful stories uh, and for really being a, a mentor and a, and a role model to, to, to myself uh, uh, 17 years ago and welcoming yeah. uh, me to this campus. And uh, you know, I know that because of you, I'm still here. And uh, I thank you um, and you know, I thank the council. Um, and you know, our community continues to grow. Uh, at, at the student body, and um, uh, there's a lot more work to do. But thank you again you know, for sharing those, those, those stories always with us and uh, all the love throughout the years. What is he, what is he, assistant you. vice president? We're just so proud of you. All right. Oh, um, I'm assistant vice president for, for student affairs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, bravo, Pedro. Yeah. Welcome back home, 
Each and every one of you. We still here, honey. We the two of us still here. Welcome back home. I wouldn't miss this occasion, but. I would be remiss not to come forth and let everyone know it's because of everyone you see on this stage that I can stand and say I've been teaching here at Stockton now for the last 15 years, the Civil Rights Movement. Of course, that wasn't even offered when I graduated in 1990 from Stockton State College. But it was that. because <laughs> of what they instilled in me and the belief in me that my research on the history of the black community in Atlantic City was worthy of graduate work. So they wrote my letters of recommendation, encouraged me to continue my research, and I went to do my master's at Temple in African American Studies with only a program certificate from here, but a BA in Sociology Anthropology because Dr. Sean Donaldson shared her experience and taught us in the classroom how to do it. And we were inspired to carry that forth. Now I'm an oral history consultant for the last 30 years. And when I went on to Howard University, who accepted my graduate work and gave me a full fellowship, I didn't have a degree in history, but I learned it here at Stockton University. My students, my my children are both Stockton alumni, and I tried to prepare them for the classrooms they were going to confront when they might be the only person of color in almost any course they would take here. But they survived, they did well, and, and they do, continue to do well. And I hope my great-grandchildren come to Stockton and Atlantic City. But I had to come and thank you thank guys. Thank you, Dr. Doctor. 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 Richland Goddard. Yeah. This thank is you. Dr. And Richland Goddard, historian. Sure. Tell you thank you. you. You know, uh, thank you, well, Doctor. Well, <laughs> this, I've been waiting for this all semester. I've been so excited about this. I thank you. I thank you for indulging my students. Each thank of them you. did an individual interview well, with I, my students. Just one more thing. I one thank more. you for that and for your time. Yes, ma'am. You asked about how we um, uh, interjected or in, in integrated um, Africana studies, I mean, you know, the, the black experience into our courses. But I want to go beyond that. Because of the Council of Black Faculty and Staff, because of UBSS, because of the Africana Studies Program, we brought people to this campus who had never heard of this little the place. The Gospel Choir. We, and the Gospel Choir. All right. We had, I, 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 some of the names I remember, of course we, we brought Karenga, Milana Karenga. Of course we brought uh, Dr. Asante. James but Baldwin. James Baldwin was here. Yes, oh, we Maya had Angelou. Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou. Maya Angelou. 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 Cornell yes. West, we yes. on Ivan Van Sertema. Yeah. Um, um, oh. Yes, Shirley Chisholm. We brought people here because we insisted on it. Our and that's one small, of our lasting legacies as well. And I just didn't want to leave without letting that know that we broadened the whole scope of what Stockton could be and what they could do. And we reached out to the community for those things and as well. And we encourage extraordinary faculty like Donnie Allison. Yeah, I was going to say Donnie, yeah. And, and John, thank you. I, I can't see with the light in my eye. But who do you have? Daryl's here, John. Okay. And, and, and I know that there Darryl's are others. in the back. Yes. And yeah. just on and on. We are, listen, we're doing our very best to try to just you know, maintain and move forward with what you have and what you mm -hmm. created and the foundation that you laid. So, you know, together, that's remember? really all I can Tony, do I'd like try. to make one comment to the yes. students. Uh, and the panel will definitely correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, power concedes nothing without a demand. I think that was Malcolm. Frederick Douglass. Frederick. I knew you would correct me. <laughs> <laughs> Frederick Douglass, power, power concedes nothing without a demand. Understand something. If you ask for nothing, you get, you nothing. get nothing. What are you asking for? And what are you demanding? I like that. Um, Donnie, can I make one suggestion? Yes, ma'am. That we do this again in Atlantic City. Yes. Um, Love to. Uh oh. Atlantic Love City. to. Because if you all are willing to come, 
Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I would love to. Yeah. This has been, Great. this has been recorded as well. This is going to be in the archives for the 50th you know anniversary. Raymond, let's work on okay. getting people from Atlantic City because Raymond is very well connected. We knew each other a long time. Right. But I'm Atlantic, saying because the community come. also needs to see this us in Atlantic about. He's the community City. Rep. Yeah. It's Raymond. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That guy right there. But I, I love that they are here. It's just, like I said, I've been waiting on semester for this, checking my calendar, emailing them ad nauseum to make sure they were coming. <laughs> because I, you know, I know what you retire it's like yeah i don't feel like doing all of that <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. but thank you, thank thank you, you. so much thank for you. your time you and your time. everything you've given to this institution and to me personally thank you so much thank you uh, sign up sheet for my class there's a sign up sheet